Mississippi, and lots of people died not long ago. And we suggested last week that we should pray for those people. Indeed, we should. And then Monday, in Nashville, Covenant School, a young woman began shooting. Nine-year-olds were killed. Teachers killed. Administrator killed. And our friend Laura is the kindergarten teacher. She's out in the playground with her kindergartners. And she hears word, run. And she does. She runs. Lose her phone, lose her shoe, and keeps her kids safe. And so Middle Tennessee's kind of in a trauma zone right now. Signs all over Nashville remembering these people. Governor Bill Lee's wife talked with some of these ladies. And then yesterday about 5 o'clock, I get a call from a very dear friend. Mike, what's up? Brett and Wendy. Well, they went camping in Cormac's Creek. Mike knows right where it is. Right there by Spencer. <coughs> and we're, we're hoping that maybe they got to somebody's house. But then the truck's found and the trailer's found and both are badly damaged in the trailer. But Wendy's body's found. And then the message comes, Brett's body's found. These are some of our dearest friends. You, you, I, I'd love to preach their funeral right now, but you don't know what God does. And I believe I can with confidence say it is well with my soul and with their soul. But the whole church, the whole church family in Lafayette is just mourning today. Just numb. And so Cindy and I cried last evening. And then I called Jerry. And Jerry says, he's going to be able to do this. I think I can. I don't know. I want to try. Because what burns in my mind Mind right now is a man poking me in the chest at the top of the metro in Budapest, Hungary. And as we were inviting people to consider Jesus, this Hungarian says, Well, where was God when the Allies were bombing Budapest in, I think, 1944? I didn't have a good answer to that when he was poking me in the chest. <coughs> but I thought, God was on the same throne. <coughs> that he was when they were butchering his son on the cross. And he wants us to remember. He wants us to remember his son that he willingly gave as a sacrifice for you and me. And so God's son died. And as Josh has reminded us, God wants us to remember do you ever wonder why we meet on Sunday? If you've ever traveled outside of the United States or maybe even outside of the area in which you live, not everybody meets at the same time on Sunday. You ever thought about how many hours on Sunday people of God are sharing in the Lord's Supper? Probably every, every hour throughout that 24-hour period, someplace in the world, somebody is sharing in the Supper of our Lord. <laughs> Different time than when we would meet, Eastern, excuse me, Central Standard Time. And people are remembering Jesus on Sunday. Are you curious about why? And, and what are we supposed to do on Sunday? What's different about Sunday? Sometimes we just take it for granted and we just do things that we think everybody should understand and everybody should be informed. This is my blood of the covenant, Jesus said, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's name. That day. What day? When is this going to happen? What is Jesus wanting us to <coughs> remember? I was going to mentioned to you that there are copies of the outline of this study back on the back table, but I'm not seeing them. You either start them up or I forgot to put them out. But if you want more and additional information, I give you the short version. There's going to be a lot of information that may not be available, but if you want it electronically, please just 
ring my bell. Better yet, send me an email. And we'll try to make sure we share that. But God has established a lot of different Memorial Days. As Cindy and I are traveling down this morning, I asked her, can you ever remember God telling people, commanding people to observe the Sabbath prior to the time of Moses? Before, and I can see some of you in your eyes, you're going, Adam, uh, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jake, no. That when did God tell people, I want you to remember the Sabbath? Now, I know God tells us about him creating everything, and on the seventh day, he rested. And we're going to move past Exodus 20, where the Ten Commandments are stated by God, and of the Commands, I think number four is remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. But look at what you're seeing on the screen there. But it's for you, Moses, speak to the sons of Israel saying, you shall surely observe my Sabbaths. For this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Therefore you are to observe the Sabbath for it is holy to you. For six days... Work may be done, but on the seventh day, there is a Sabbath of complete rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall surely be put to death. The Israelites are to observe the Sabbath, celebrating it for the generations to come as a lasting covenant. Who is to celebrate the Sabbath? Israelites. And did you ever wonder why particularly the Israelites. Well, when you read Deuteronomy chapter 5, you get a fuller picture. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. How many days off did they get when they were slaves in Egypt? Who finally gives them rest? The Lord. And so this seventh day is a holy day for you Israelites to remember. You didn't get a day off until I gave you rescue. And you remember me as you remember the Sabbath. So there's a model of a memorial day. And then we think about the national holidays. There were three of them. There was the Passover, which was followed by seven days of unleavened bread. There was the Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks. And the reason it's called the Feast of Weeks is because there were seven weeks between Passover and Pentecost, and Pentecost always came on Sunday. You might not have known that. But when you read carefully in Leviticus 23, 16, it is the first day of the week following the seventh Sabbath. So Pentecost was always on Sunday. It was the day of in gathering. It was when the barley harvest has come in. And it is a celebration time. And then the day of atonement, seventh month, 14th day, followed by a feast of tents, camping out for seven days, remembering you used to didn't have a house. And so these were the memorials that God gave the Israelites to remember. Jesus wants us to remember Him and to eat and drink in memory of Him. But first day of the week, the first day of the week is mentioned in various places in the New Testament. What was the significance of the day for the first Christians? Let's try to explore that. Matthew 28 and verse 1, the first day of the week is the day after Sabbath. The Sabbath is what we call Saturday. Sunday is the first day of the week. You're going to see more of that. I used to be curious about that. How do we know what day? How do we know when? Why did they call it Sunday? Maybe I was the only curious one, but I hope you have those kind of questions and you're looking for answers. Some people refer to the first day of the week as the Christian Sabbath. Have you ever heard Christian Sabbath? I think I heard that growing up, and, I, and I'm not trying to accuse anybody. But where do we get this idea of the Christian Sabbath? 
I know that parents want to rest and need to rest on Sunday afternoon. But there is no biblical expression of the Christian Sabbath. Now there's a Sabbath that remains for the children of God. And we're longing for that great rest with Him. But the seventh day is the week we call Saturday. It's the Jewish Sabbath. The first day of the week is never called a Sabbath in the New Testament. Best I can tell. They're separate days of the week. Now I have good friends, some Hungarians, who think we should be assembling on Saturday rather than Sunday. They're known as Seventh-day Adventists. And so let's just kind of look through and see what we can find in the Scriptures. Did the first day of the week have some meaning for the first Christians? Is it purely incidental that the first day of the week is mentioned in the New Testament, or does it have some kind of special meaning? You know, all four Gospels mention explicitly that Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the week. We're going to walk through each one of those. The first day of the week had special meaning for the first Christians because Jesus rose from the dead on that day. The first Christians celebrated the resurrection of Jesus each week. You'll notice in the bulletin today that there is a pretty lengthy article by our brother Bill Hall about welcoming others. It's quite possible that other friends are going to be here next week. There's some of you who are visiting, I think, maybe for the very first time today. We're delighted that you're here. You're, you are special and honored guests. And we'd love it if you would write down on a card so we can say thank you if you just give us your name and, a, and a, if you're willing, a phone number or an email. Because you're obviously looking for God. And you're investing in wanting to know about God. And that's a wonderful thing. But you know, next week, there may be even more people who are looking for God. And rather than bashing them for the fact that they came on Easter Sunday, let's be glad they came. And let's also understand for ourselves that Christians remember Jesus every first day of the week. Now, I've made a bold statement there. Let's see if we can shore that up with Scripture. Let's look to see if that thesis can be sustained. And so as we walk through this, we're going to just kind of notice as we're reading through that after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. Spencer shared with us this gathering on the very first day of the week. Mark's going to tell us, Now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. When was Jesus raised from the dead? The first day of the week. We need to always remember that. When we go on to Luke, now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, Mary and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. John's going to tell us on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've laid Him. First day of the week. The Romans called that day Sunday. We still call it Sunday. Then the same day, at the evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Same day, same Sunday, same first day of the week. Not only did Jesus rise on the first day of the week, but it is also specifically stated that Jesus appeared to them on the first day of the week. And eight days later, on the first day of the week, and Thomas was present 
on that second occasion. Christians assembled on the first day of the week. It, it was on the first day of the week that Christians came together to remember Jesus as He had asked them to do by dividing unleavened bread among them and drinking from the cup. This was referred to as breaking bread. When you're reading Acts 2, you got all these people who've come to Jesus, at least 3,000, and they're saying, what do we do now? And the apostles say, you need to continue steadfastly in the teaching about Jesus. You need to continue steadfastly in the fellowship. Continue in the breaking of bread. That was just an expression they used to remember Jesus. And we'll kind of follow that in the historical outline that Luke will give us. Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued the message until midnight. Now I want you to realize, Jesus not once told us specifically, as is recorded in Scripture, I want you to do this on Sunday. What Jesus did is said, you disciples, you go and teach. You teach everything I want you to teach, and you teach it to everybody. And so what you have in Acts 20 is a model. And in fact, it's the only model of when the disciples would get together to remember Jesus. So in Acts 20, Paul is in a hurry to get to Jerusalem by Pentecost. He's only got a few days left, and he's going to stay a whole week there in Troas. And on the first day of the week, he shares with them as they come together to break bread. Now you got to do some you got to make some decisions. You got to reach some conclusions there. Is this something they did every first day of the week? Was this something God told them to do on the first day of the week? You see that next quote down there? I'm not a Greek scholar. Some of you in the audience are and you can fix this if it's not correct. And please do. The passive voice form were gathered together or brought together. Acts 20, reflects the fact that the assembly was initiated by an independent source beyond the disciples themselves, doubtless by divine authority. Why were the people in Troas who were following Jesus getting together on the first day of the week? Did they just say, hey, you know, I think Sunday would be a good day for us. I'm not doing anything on Sunday. I think that will be a good day. Or were they instructed that Jesus wants you to be together on the first day of the week? to remember Him. Those are at least a couple of options. Josh kind of hinted at that in what he said, that this is something we're instructed to do. I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but I think that was the idea. That, that we don't just do this because, oh, we, this tradition just started. Somewhere, the disciples of Jesus got to doing this on the first day of the week. Now, we've got lots of questions about well, which first day of the week? And, and those of you who come from various religious traditions said, well, you guys do this every week. We only do it on Easter. Or we only do it on Easter and Christmas. Or we only do it once a quarter. Or we only do it once a month. Why do you guys do it every week? Fair question, isn't it? All we have in the model is they did it on the first day of the week. Paul's waiting seven days so he can be there to share with them on the first day of the week. If your coach told you, we're having practice on Saturday, throughout this season, practice is on Saturday, what day would you show up for practice? Saturday. Would you say, did you mean Easter Saturday or Christmas Saturday or the first Saturday of the month? I think you just understand, coach said, practice is on Saturday. And you'd know that meant every Saturday. When the Israelites were told to remember the Sabbath, to keep it holy, they didn't have to say, hmm, now which one did you mean? Did you mean the one at Pentecost or Passover or Day of Atonement? They understood that every time a Saturday rolled around, that was the Sabbath and I was to rest. That's implicit in the instruction. Perhaps that's helpful. Please give it some consideration. All right, we're getting to the situation now where there's going to be another church. 
and they're going to be messing up what they're doing with the Lord's Supper, the Corinthians. And Christopher, that's your cue there to get ready to go ahead and read. While everybody else turns in your Bible, 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 17. Go ahead, try it. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 17, New Testament, about the middle, 1 Corinthians 4. Did you sometimes wonder if maybe the people at Troas were the only ones who were doing this on Sunday? Did you wonder if maybe the people at Corinth were doing it on Monday? Did you wonder if the people at Philippi maybe decided Tuesday was their day? Did the apostles just teach randomly different things, different places? Is a question you should be asking. And so as Christopher stands up and reads 1 Corinthians 4, 17, trying to help the Corinthians and also emphasizing, listen to Timothy, let's just hear what he said. Would you go ahead and do that now? 1 Corinthians 4, I think it's 17. When I first saw that, there it is. I've been looking at it. I thought, how do I know that Paul taught what Peter taught? How do I know that they both taught what Jesus wanted them to teach? And did they teach the same thing everywhere? What does Paul say? Paul says, I taught the same thing everywhere in every church. And that's the term Catholicity. Yeah, you heard the word Catholic in there. That's the idea of universality. That's the idea that everybody who's following Jesus is all being given the same standard of instructions. I teach the same thing everywhere in every church. Now that doesn't mean there weren't specific issues that had to be addressed some places that weren't problems in other places. But when it comes to things like remembering Jesus, remembering the supper, I teach the same thing everywhere in every church. And so he will go on to say to the Corinthians, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. That's chapter 11. That the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till He comes. Corinthians, when you're coming together on the first day of the week, you need to be doing this the way Jesus instructed for us to do this. First day of of the week. So some of you are just, you know, scratching your head. You think, well, I always wondered why we did that. And you kind of notice that this first day of the week thing was not simply in regard to the Lord's Supper. Oh, that was primary. I think we really need to think about, and I really appreciate this church, because the supper is primary. That does not negate the need for preaching and teaching. But we come together on the Lord's day to remember the Lord and His Supper. And so as we look at this, Paul's anticipating, and of course you're going to be coming together on the first day of the week, and concerning the collection for the saints. This is a particular collection relating to needs in Jerusalem. As I have given order to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also on the first day of the week. Let each of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. Which day of the week do churches take up a collection? Typically, the first day of the week. And they don't just do it two times a year or once a month. They understand the principle when they see it in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. This expression on the first day of the week here has the inherent meaning on the first day of every week. This was not just a local arrangement. The same orders were given everywhere in every church. The first day of the week is also referred to as the Lord's Day. In Revelation 1 and verse 10, John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. The only place in the New Testament where the possessive form, Lord, mine, is used is in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty. That's the only other place. In connection with the Lord's Supper, this distinctive expression, the Lord's Day, is found in the early church history as a designation for the first day of the week. 
I can't tell you absolutely for sure when I read in Revelation 1.10 that John is in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, that it absolutely refers to Sunday. I think it does, but I can't say absolutely. But what I can know is that people who wrote about this Sunday observance after this time almost always referred to it as the Lord's Day. And so you're going to be getting a good many quotations. I'm going to really reduce it down for you. But if you want more, there are plenty more, and I'll be glad to share those with you electronically. This distinct expression, the Lord's Day, those who insist that we should still keep the Sabbath day often make the false claim that Constantine, that's 4th century, 303 to 315, somewhere around there, change the day of Christian worship from Saturday to Sunday. It's not true. It's, it's a popular myth, but it's not true. And they claim that he did that in the 4th century. All Constantine did was to officially recognize the existing day of worship was the first day of the week, the day the Romans called Sunday. The teaching of Scripture that Christians assemble on the first day of the week to eat the Lord's Supper is reflected throughout early writings following the writings of the apostles. This is called evidences from patristics, church fathers. These are old wise guys who have been following Jesus after the apostles are dead. But remember, this is not God's holy breathed supernatural Scripture. These are historical references after the first century. And they're being shared here to demonstrate to you that for centuries prior to Constantine even being born, Christians were assembling on the first day of the week to remember Jesus. Okay? So let's just walk through a few of these momentarily. You've got a book ascribed to Barnabas. I don't believe the Barnabas we know wrote it. But if you want somebody to read your work, you put a famous name on it. And that's what happened. And so you've got this, Wherefore also we keep the eighth day with joyfulness, the day also on which Jesus rose again from the dead. I'm going to skip other references and move to a period shortly after the apostles have died. A man named Justin Martyr in his book on Apologies, chapter 67. And on that day called Sunday, all who live in cities or in the country gather together into one place. Sunday is the day on which we all hold our common assembly because it is the day on which God, having wrought a change in the darkness and matter, made the world and Jesus Christ, our Savior, on the same day rose from the dead. Now he's going to continue his discussions with a guy named Trypho who's a Jew. And in this dialogue, Trypho is going to say, what's wrong with you people? You don't observe the Sabbath. Here's what he says. But this is what we are most at a loss about, that you, professing to be pious and supposing yourselves better than others, are not in any particular way separated from them. And do not alter your mode of living from the nations. In that, you observe no festivals or Sabbaths and do not have the right of circumcision. How can you claim to be following God and you don't have a Sabbath and you don't do circumcision? Because you're disciples of Christ, not simply disciples of Moses. So Justin replies, the new law requires you to keep perpetual Sabbath and you because you are idle for one day suppose you are pious not discerning why this has been commanded you. Pliny, living a, a little bit later. Sorry, I didn't get that for you to see. Pliny is a governor in the time of Trajan, and he's trying to figure out what are we supposed to do with these people who are called Christians. And so he's writing a letter to Trajan saying, here's what I'm doing, is this okay? They affirmed, however, that the whole of their guilt, that's the Christians, or their error was that they were in the habit of meeting on a certain fixed day before it was light. When they sang in alternative verse a hymn to Christ as to a God, 
and bound themselves to a solemn oath not to do any wicked deeds, but never to commit any fraud, theft, adultery, never to falsify their word, nor to deny a trust when they were, would be called upon to deliver it up. What am I supposed to do with these weird people? They get together really early in the morning and they keep their word and they don't commit any bad things. I've been threatening them and I've been killing some of them. Is that okay, Trajan? You can read more. And then Barta Sainz, kind of wrapping this up. And what shall we say of the new race of us Christians, whom Christ at His advent planted in every country and in every region? For lo, wherever we are, we are all called after the one name of Christ, Christians. On one day, the first day of the week, we assemble ourselves together. We follow Christ. We're Christians. We assemble on His day to remember Him. Emeritus, just to see the picture before Constantine, describes what's happening to the Christians there in the region of North Africa. And Philip Comfort makes this observation about this quote. He says, when he was ordered to give up his copy of the Scriptures, he refused by saying, the Scriptures were engraved on his heart. None of these guys who were threatened at this occasion recanted their faith or disclosed where their copies of Scripture were hidden. All 49 of them were killed. These people treasure the Scriptures. These people treasure the first day of the week. So let me ask you, what time on Sunday are we supposed to get together? Are we supposed to get together in the morning? Are we supposed to get together in the afternoon? Or are we supposed to get together in the evening? And if you're thinking, your answer is yes. And we've worshipped in places where they assemble in the evening. I've worshipped in places where they assemble in the afternoon. And I've worshipped in places where they assemble in the morning. On the first day of the week. And then there are people who say, we just want to get together more often. Can we do it morning? Could we do it in the afternoon? Could we get together in the evening? Lots of opportunities. And so what about Sunday evening services? Could we as a church get together on Sunday evening? In Acts 20, when the disciples get together and they share in the Lord's Supper, Paul preaches till midnight. Now, I don't know if he's real long-winded and he's been preaching for 14 to 16 hours or not, but I'm thinking maybe they got together in the evening and poor Eutychus just kind of got overwhelmed with sleep and fell out the window. So we have models throughout Scripture of getting together several different times of day. And this second service idea, coming back together, really seemed to happen almost incidentally in our country. We got together and we had lunch and we said, hey, why don't we have another sermon? Why don't we, why don't we study some more? Why don't we sing some more songs? And then during World War II and people having to work, and some of us know from your steel relation, you, you, you had to work on Sunday morning. So when can I get together? When can I be with God's people? When can I share in the Lord's Supper? And so some began meeting on Sunday nights to accommodate others you had to work on Sunday morning. An evening service allowed them the opportunity to meet with the saints. Do I have to assemble with the saints? No. God's not going to make you. You don't have to assemble. But please don't confuse the first day of the week with the Sabbath. The Sabbath was for the Jews, and that ended when Jesus' law came into being. And so don't let anybody judge you regarding a festival, new moon, or a Sabbath day. So why do we come together? We come together to remember Jesus. In Hebrews 10, you have this series of let us, let us stimulate one another. Let us draw near. Let us come together. Let us help each other as God's people. When people love God, they love God's people. I think I heard that earlier this morning. We want to be together. We want to share together. We want to remember Christ, and we want to encourage each other. And that's why Jesus designed assemblies of God's people. And so you're here because you're looking for God. You're wanting to know His will. You're wanting to know when. Where and how does Jesus want me 
to worship. F.F. F. Bruce makes this point in Acts 20. He says, the meeting was held in the evening. That's his assumption. A convenient time for many members of the Gentile churches who were not their own masters and were not free in the daytime. Imagine the depth of dedication evidenced by those who had labored hard, perhaps 12 hours, and yet were so dedicated to the memory of the crucified Son of God that they could not bear to neglect the Lord's day worship. I've seen some of you. I've watched you. And I saw my dad for years. He'd work all night on Saturday night. And he'd come on Sunday morning. And yeah, he would get drowsy sometimes, but he wanted to be with God's people. And he wanted to share in the supper. And I've seen some of you come. I've seen you come on Wednesday night. And you're just dead tired. You've already been at work 12 hours. But you want to be here. You want to be here for your children. You want to be here for yourself. And you want to be here for your brothers and sisters and your wife. You come together to honor God. And you don't have to plead with people to come together who want to honor God and encourage each other. You just don't. They come because they want to be here, even when they've worked for a long day. And so what we do is the love of Christ compels us. We, we look and we judge. If He died for everybody, then we've all died. We died because He died. Those who live now should no longer live for themselves, but for Him who died for them and rose again. Thank you for listening. If I've taught things that aren't true, if I've just taught things that are new to you, if, if you're just wondering, about, wait a second, Alan, can, can you really sustain that? Can you really establish? Be glad to have the discussion. And it's especially important to be patient with new Christians because this is all new to them and they're trying to do what God wants. And please, next week, as well as all the visitors who come today, know their names. Talk with them. Move into the middle so they can have the end of the pew. Welcome people to come who are looking for Jesus. We'll figure out something. we get some more chairs. We'll make room. But let us be grateful for the opportunity to tell somebody, Jesus is my King. He's my Lord, and I want you to know about Him. If you've not yet chosen Him, perhaps even now you'd say, hey, I want to know more. I want to follow Jesus. Now would be a great time to get started as we stand and sing.